Welcome back, everybody. Today, we have a very important video and one that I'm sure is somewhat anticipated. I'm going to discuss HECA operators briefly. This will be the first in a series of a few videos on the operators. We won't get into any of their properties or anything, but we'll look at their definition and a couple of different perspectives on them. So first, some notation. Let's let n be a natural number. Let's let p be a prime. Let's let delta sub p denote the set of two by two matrices with integer coefficients and determinant p which when you reduce their entries mod n give you a matrix very simply of the form of one star zero p where star is whatever you want, okay? You can check immediately that delta sub p is stable under left and right multiplication by gamma sub one of n, I'll let you do that. Let's set gamma equal to gamma sub one of n just temporarily and let's let delta sub p be the matrix one zero zero p. So we want that matrix with that lower right entry p. Okay, it turns out you can think of delta sub p in two different ways. First of all, there's a double coset interpretation. Delta sub p turns out to be gamma delta p gamma, which means it's the set of all matrices that look like something in gamma times delta p times something in gamma. But also, you can decompose delta sub p into disjoint right cosets as follows. If p doesn't divide n, then delta sub p is the union from v or i equals zero to p minus one of the right cosets gamma times one V zero P union gamma diamond P times the matrix P zero zero one. And if P does divide in, you get the exact same thing, but you don't get this last chunk on the end here. You just get this union. Okay. Now, first of all, recall that if P doesn't divide in, what does diamond of P mean? It denotes any element of gamma sub zero of N with the lower right entry congruent to P mod N. We talked about this before. Okay, now this should look somewhat familiar to you if you remember the videos on Hecke correspondences. This matrix here is the multiplication by P matrix. This is the Z plus V over P matrix. These are the exact same sort of terms that showed up in the upper half plane orbit theoretic interpretation of the Hecke correspondences, and that's no accident. So we'll talk about that. Um, in a couple of slides, so there are definitely incredibly strong relationships between HECA correspondences and HECA operators. In fact, they're two sides of the same coin, um, but we'll only look at one of those relationships today. We'll see more of them later. Okay, now, since delta sub p is stable under right multiplication by gamma sub one of n, if gamma is in gamma sub one of n, and if the set, if the set of a bunch of deltas is any set of representation uh, representatives for the distinct right cosets of gamma sub one of n and delta p, then the set of all the delta gammas is another such set. In other words, if I take a set of representatives for distinct right cosets of gamma sub one of n and delta p, let's just call all of those representatives delta one, delta two, delta three, and so on. If you give me any gamma and gamma sub one of n, then I can take each of those representatives and multiply on the right by delta, and that'll give me a complete new set of representatives for distinct right cosets of that same setup. Okay. In other words, sets of coset representatives don't change when you multiply them on the right by a fixed element of gamma sub one of n. Okay. Now, so what are what are the HECA operators? Well, for a weight k and level n that are handed to you, the pth HECA operator on S sub k n, so this is the weight k level n cusp forms is a map TP from S k of n to S sub k of n. So it's a linear operator like you think it should be. And here's what it is. T sub p of f is p to the k over two minus one power times the sum over delta of f bar sub k delta, where delta runs over a set of representatives for the distinct right cosets of gamma sub one of n and delta p, which I outlined with those words just above. So you're taking f, you're, applying the bar sub k delta operator to it for all delta running over a set of distinct uh, representatives for distinct right cosets, gamma sub one of n and delta p, you're summing them all up and you're multiplying by this power of p out front. The power of p out front is generally to make certain formulations and calculations nicer. It's not strictly necessary. I've even seen it not being there, um, but usually there is some kind of, some, some kind of power of p out front. Okay, this definition is well-defined meaning it does end up, the image is an S sub k n. And it's independent of the choice of representative. So I guess it's well-defined in another sense. You might ask, what if you take a different set of representatives for the distinct right cosets? Uh, you can check that you end up with the same formula in any case. So any other set of representatives will look like delta gamma 
for some gamma and gamma sub one of n, you can check that this sum over delta is the same as this sum over delta gamma. So that's a good exercise if you haven't tried that before. Um, I would check like Diamond and Sherman chapter five and CSS chapter three for more information on all of this if you haven't seen any of this before. Okay, these are not the most intuitive operators in the world in my opinion, although uh, the more you study them, uh, the less that's true. So um, let's look at a heck of operators from a different perspective and let's look at a first relationship to heck of correspondences. So more conceptually, let's let K be two now just for simplicity. And let's let P be a prime that doesn't divide our N. Recall that the curves given by, so we have the elliptic curve C mod, the lattice generated by tau plus I over P in one comma, the N torsion data one over N and I here runs from zero to P minus one. And the curve C mod the lattice generated by P tau N1 um, with N torsion data P over N. Those, we, we talked about this, these are the only P plus one elliptic curves over C with gamma sub one of N structure, meaning equipped with a point of order N, whose images of the enhanced elliptic curve given by just C mod the lattice generated by tau N1 equipped with the N torsion point one over N by a degree P isogeny. So we take this generic elliptic curve here, this generic enhanced elliptic curve for gamma sub one event. We look at all of its possible images under degree P isogenies. And here are the only P plus one curves we end up with. Okay, we've, we've seen all of this before. We also saw that if P does divide N, there are only P such degree P isogenies or P such images. And the reason for that is these are all good, but C mod, the lattice generated by p tau and one comma p over n, that's not a gamma sub one of n structure anymore because p divides n, so p over n is not a point of order n. So we have to get rid of this. And you only end up with, with p images, okay? So keeping this in mind there, and by the way, when did we discuss all this? This was all discussed when we were talking about the moduli theoretic and the orbit theoretic interpretation of the Hecke correspondences. And so keeping this all in mind, another formula for T sub pf is as follows. You take the sum from i equals zero to p minus one of f evaluated at t plus i over p. You average that. So you don't just take the sum, but you take the average. That's why we divide by p, because there are p guys in the sum here. And then you add on p diamond p f of p tau if p doesn't divide n, because you've got this extra image under a degree p isogeny in that case. If p does divide n, you just take this first part to be your formula. You just take this, this average over these p I guess you could say this average of F evaluated at tau plus I over P, you just take that part, okay? So you're, what you're doing here is you're like, you're taking F and you're evaluating it at each one of these generators. That's what's going on. See P tau here, here's P tau. You're taking F, you're evaluating it, all the non-trivial generators of all the lattices which admit an elliptic curve, which is the image under you're given generic elliptic curve for gamma sub one event under a degree P isogeny. You're adding them all up, taking the average, and you're good to go. Okay. And then this, why is there this extra P diamond P in front of the F of P tau here? It's basically because your point here is no longer one over N, it's P over N. So there's this extra factor out front to make things kind of go right. But I mean, the real answer is go back to the video on the Hecke correspondences. And you'll see exactly that there's also a P diamond P in the moduli slash orbit theoretic interpretations of the Hecke correspondences. Okay, so things match up perfectly. So let me give you another perspective on Hecke operators. Let's, uh, let's consider the following maps from H to H. Okay, we'll call the first ones phi sub i of tau, and those will just be tau plus i over p, where i runs from zero to p minus one. And we'll also look at phi sub infinity of tau, which is just, you know, uh, diamond p times p tau. So this is diamond P acting on P tau, okay, uh, by fractional linear transformation. So what you notice is there's kind of one map per image curve listed on the previous slide. There's one map per generator of lattice, which admits an, which admits an image of the elliptic curve C mod the lattice generated by tau one, one over n under a degree P isogeny, okay? So we're taking one map per kind of non-trivial lattice generator. Now, one way of thinking about the Hecke operators is as follows. What I can do is I can take F and I can look at the differential associated to it. And I have a whole video on this coming up soon, but it's just the differential F of tau d tau. 
This is a holomorphic differential on H associated to the function F on H that we were handed, okay? Now, I've got these maps, right? Phi sub I, okay, from H to H, that induces a map phi sub i star from differentials on this copy of h to differentials on this copy of h by pullback by composition with this map here phi sub i. So I can take all the holomorphic differentials or I can take the holomorphic differential wf and I can pull it back under phi sub i by phi sub i star to a holomorphic differential on this copy of h here giving me a bunch of holomorphic differentials phi star sub i of wf and I can sum those all up over all my various maps and it turns out that when you do that you get nothing but the holomorphic differential associated to TP of F, which is awesome. So this is a great, clean, succinct interpretation of the HECA operators, provided you don't want to deal directly with the HECA operator and you'd rather deal with its differential. I mean, you kind of sacrifice directness for cleanliness here. Okay, uh, what's really going on here? This is the slide that I'm a little bit unsure on, but I, I was watching Richard Borchard's series of videos on HECA operators and it seemed to me that he was implying that the following was true. Let's consider an extremely simple situation and we'll speak a little loosely on this slide. Let's just take an F that's invariant under SL2Z. Okay, so like a modular function. Okay, what I mean is just F of gamma Z is F of Z for all gamma and SL2Z. We're not looking at any automorphic factor CZ plus D to the K or anything. We're still looking determinant one. What's going on here is that if I look at f of pz instead of just f of z, f of pz is no longer invariant under SL2 zoo, uh, SL2 of z like f is. Now it is under, invariant under gamma sub zero of p, but you can view it as a problem if you like that f is invariant under SL2 of z, but f of pz isn't. Okay. And so what TP does is it fixes that problem because T sub p of f will be invariant under SL2Z, and it will have F of PZ as one of its terms in the sum, okay? So it's like F of PZ isn't, but that's because you have to add some stuff to it to get it to be invariant under SL2Z. Hopefully that makes sense. And if anybody knows any more about this perspective, uh, please do chime in in the comments. So next video, we'll look at some properties of HECA operators. So thanks for watching and I'll see you then.